Thanks very much for coming out. I hope you have a great night and you get an idea. This is a taste of Yao. Just imagine there's like 40 speakers like these guys and you sort of feel what it's like. So thanks very much for coming. Eric. Um, now, when, uh, I was, uh, when Dave asked me to talk, I said, you know, I, the most fun talk um, I've ever done is this talk called, you know, Fundamentalist Functional Programming. Because a lot of people talk about functional programming, but they're not really doing functional programming. Functional programming is really easy. What is it? It is, you know, well, uh, let me say first, what is object-oriented programming? Well, that's programming with objects. But what is an object? I don't know, it's like, you know, something that represents a real world entity, blah, blah, blah. Now we're already kind of getting fake. But if you ask, what well, is functional programming? Well, that's programming with functions. Well, my son just finished high school, and guess what? When he did the SAT test, there is on page 35 of the book, there is a definition, what is a function? So every high school student knows what, what is a function, okay? But then, when we start programming, we forget what a function is, and then we're kind of programming, and we say we're doing functional programming, and we say, where are the functions? You know, they're not functions. Um, so, and, but since the word functional programming was already taken, you know, I had to call it fundamentalist functional programming. Um, now, something happened in the meantime. Uh, some um, side effect happened. Um, one of the examples that I give in that talk is about mixing side effects and, cl and closures. Um, and the example that I used, you know, has now been fixed in C-sharp. So there has been a breaking uh, change in C-sharp 5.0, and now my example doesn't work anymore. So I had to give a, a completely um, new talk. So let me kind of explain to you what, what's going on here. So Eric Lippert, a uh, very interesting guy if you don't read his blog. Again, this blog is kind of, you know, super interesting for any programmer, not just a Microsoft programmer. He has a kind of, you know, this is from 2009, you know, closing over loop variables considered harmful, you know, one of the 1500 kind of, you know, papers called something considered harmful. Um, and then there's a little update there saying, you know, we have a breaking change. And poof, there went my talk because my talk was about, you know, about this. So let's um, look at this example and see what's going on here. Okay, so there's a kind of the simplest program um, that you can imagine. It's a, a, a loop for each variable in this, uh, you know, in this array. Um, I assume that you know, everybody can read this even if you're a Java programmer or a JavaScript programmer. So it just iterate over the values zero to uh, four and then I print them. Now, the thing is that there's a variable being declared there, okay? And if you have uh, taken a compiler course, you know that declaring a variable is not just declaring a variable. You know, you have to allocate some space, um, you know, somewhere on the stack, and, you know, you have to then, you know, after you exit the scope, you have to remove the thing. So there is that variable there, but where is it really declared? Where is it allocated, okay? So let's... Uh, run some tests. So let's first see, you know, is it declared outside the loop? So and I cannot change the, kind of, you know, uh, the, the loop, so I kind of, you know, I declare the variable outside and then I, I assign it kind of, you know, inside here to simulate, you know, that the variable is declared outside. Or the other thing, is it declared inside? So for every iteration, is a new variable allocated? So now, what do you think? Is it outside or inside? And, or, or does it matter? You say, Eric, you're such a theorist. Well, who cares, you know, if it's outside or inside? Uh, it just works, okay? So, and if you don't have closures, it really doesn't matter. You cannot tell the difference, okay? You, if, if you run these programs, they give you exactly the same answer. Who cares? You, you cannot observe the difference. Maybe if you put the debugger and you look, you can see it, but... Normally, you cannot observe the difference where the variable is allocated, before the loop or after the loop. Now, the thing is that it's, this is an interesting thing. It, it looks like a trivial thing, but if you look at JavaScript, for example, in JavaScript, if you write, if you declare a variable somewhere, really that means nothing because all the variables are declared at the beginning of the function. So even in JavaScript, if you write this, 
it still kind of, you know, behaves like that. Um, so every language is slightly different um, in this respect. And you can always kind of find, um, you know, once you have closures, it becomes easier. You can find kind of subtle differences. So, you know, you pull your hair out because you have a bug, and then it turns out that there's some side effect that you can observe because a variable kind of, you know, gets allocated every time in the loop or not. Okay, but in this case, um, if I run these three uh, programs, I get the expected output. I guess that this is the expected output. I just want to iterate over the array and um, get four values. Okay, now this code looks already a little bit um, fishy. Um, so let's uh, look at it in more detail. So the first um, loop there is just the same as I did before, except what I'm going to do is in, instead of printing that value directly, I'm capturing that loop variable in closure, putting that closure in a list, and then I'm just running through the list and call that function, okay? So I'm just deferring printing the variable, the, the value of the variable, and uh, by putting it in this list of functions. And again, um, in, in JavaScript, you know, you would just write function, open paren, it should be kind of, you know, very similar. In Java, I'm sorry, you have to wait until Java, I don't know when they will have closures, 2020 maybe. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that's the first thing. So now, um, and, and I've rewritten the, the outer and the inner one um, in a similar way. So don't get, um, oops, this is like suicide here. Uh, don't, don't get too kind of, you know, confused here because the code is exactly the same. So I, I create the, uh, the um, list of functions here. I do the for each loop. And then what I do is I copy the loop variable into this local variable, and that's the one that I capture. And in this case, I declare the variable before the loop, and then I capture, and I, I've used some kind of, you know, Suggestive notation, so the, the, the underscore on the outside means it's bound on the outer, and here it means it's bound, bound on the inner. Okay? Good. So now you're all kind of you know, way smarter than me, so you probably already know what this will print. Right? So which one will print um, 444? I did this once with 999 or whatever, but uh, that would take too long. So. In C sharp 4.0, this one would print 4. And so really, the, the semantics was that the variable is declared outside the loop. Okay? And then if you want to, to get like, you know, the expected behavior, you would have to kind of you know, declare a variable in here. And I must, say, I must admit, I had this bug several times. I can still remember that I was... Um, this is was like a marathon programming session with one of my devs, and ah, it just didn't work. And so my dev started to kind of go and decompile into IL and kind of look at the machine code. And I said, ho, 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 wait a second. Let's, let's look here. What did we do? Um, and then it turned out that we kind of you know, captured a variable like that in a closure. And, and instead of getting you know, 0, 1, 2, 4, we got 4, 4, 4. So in C-sharp, and this was my example in my previous talk, to show that when you have mutable variables and closures, you get a toxic brew. Now, this is really, really dangerous. Um, but then in C-sharp 5, um, we, uh, this was changed, and now uh, it behaves like this. So um, now the problem is, um, so this is great, I think. This, like, you can see, like, every day on the forum, and I, I'm not sure every day, but, like, this is the most asked questions on the forum. It's like, what's going on here? Why doesn't this work? Or, you know, people kind of bang their head against the wall. And so I think this is a good fix. Um, now, of course, um, if this is the behavior that you want, so if for some reason you, you do want kind of, you know, 444, you can still kind of you know, change your code to kind of allocate the variable kind of outside the loop. So nothing has lost, so you can still express what you want. Um, but you know, the default is now that it behaves as if a new variable is allocated um, inside the loop. Now, this is not as um, 
um, natural as you might think because um, there's also the for loop and the for loop is unchanged. So if you, if you do the for loop, um, that's still here as if the variable was um, allocated outside. And the reasoning is that people expect when they write a for loop, um, since there is um, some side effect on the variable there anyway, so they expect that there's only a single variable that you side effect. So um, that's again a little bit of a disadvantage because now you have to, sometimes you switch between for loops and for each loops um, and now you get a little bit of a headache. Fortunately, we have ibuprofen or whatever, so, or beer um, that will take care of that. Okay, so this is uh, some really kind of tiny, I, I love these things, like tiny, tiny programs that do things that you don't expect or that can you know, cause um, some interesting behavior. Now the question is, who gets the blame, okay? Because some people may say, you know, the, 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 the when I was a young Eric, when I was a fundamentalist functional programmer, I would say, of course, you know, you're using mutable state, you should not do that. Use Haskell or a real language and this won't happen. Um, but on the other hand, now that I kind of, you know, um, write code for a living, I kind of like imperative programming. You know, you, you can get stuff done, you know. <laughs> So I'm not so sure anymore how who to blame. So let, let, let's look, look at this, let, let's look at this here. I think the, the world is imperative, okay? The real world is imperative. Um, and how, why do I say that? Well, um, you know, if you have two programs here that are executing and that program here on the right, you look to the state of the program on the left and you know, it's something like, you know, the, the Microsoft logo and then you look again and it's something different and then this morning you wake up and you look and the logo has changed again, okay? So the real world is imperative. This logo doesn't, you know, it, it really changes. Um, and so I think we need to embrace side effects. I think side effects are good. Side effects are what makes the world tick, okay? So let's not do kind of crazy things with, you know, pure functions and so on. That's great for math books. That's good for SAT books. That's good to forget about, once you leave high school, forget about functions. Once you go to university or to real work, let's do imperative programming because the real world is imperative. Now, you, you don't believe me, right? You think, oh, Eric, he's just joking. So I need three volunteers to prove that the real world is imperative. One volunteer. There you come, two volunteers. Um, and then you, you're kind of, you're like every volunteer is kind of looking away, hoping that he doesn't get kind of, yeah. So let's come here and you pull on this leg, you pull on that leg, you pull on that leg. And now we're going to kind of, you know, rip this thing apart. Yes, yes, for real. Okay. Okay. Look, so we have now, we first had a kind of cute toy. You can sit down. Thank you very much. This is exactly the effect that I wanted. We had a cute toy, and now we performed a destructive update on this toy. <laughs> there's no transaction, there's no way I can put, ever put this back, and even if I would sew it up again, it would not be the same toy, okay? So if you don't believe that the world is imperative, think of this poor little, you know, cuddly toy. The world is super imperative. There's destructive updates that cannot be undone. I could not copy this thing and then, you know, mutate the copy. This thing is mutated and this thing is dead. Okay? So, that if, you know, you can forget everything I say today if you just remember. The world is imperative. The world takes on side effects. Good. All right. So now we can all go and drink beer. But it's just the same thing. You open the beer, you drink it, it's empty. No side effects, uh, well, all side effects. <laughs> okay, so now, if we, if we now say that um, all that mutation is how the world should be, okay, then who is guilty? It's definitely not the, the, the loop there that kind of, you know, updates the variable. It's not 
this guy here that was doing also kind of nasty things, it had a list and it kind of you added elements to the list that captured that variable, also innocent. So, but we still have to assign blame. So the only thing that we can blame is the protocol between the two, the interaction between the producer and the consumer. That must be wrong because the imperative actions are perfect, so it must be the thing that glues these different imperative actions together. So let's look at that, okay? So, but this is the main thing that I'm going to do. There's kind of quite a lot of kind of blood here on the floor from the, from the little animal. Um, anyway, um, so what we have to do is we have to acknowledge the presence of effects, okay? We should not try to fight it or whatever. We should deal with it and we should think about it and make it explicit. So there are several things that we can do. If we look at this producer consumer here, so this was the thing, the loop, and this was the, uh, um, the list of actions where you know, I just accumulated um, the uh, variable. So there's several things I can do, okay? First of all, I notice that what's really going on is that there's a sequence of values that are communicated between the producer and the consumer. Every time I go around the loop, there was some mutation happening and something happened. So that's the first clue, is that there's a stream of things happening, okay? And I can deal with that by every time reading that value, but then something goes wrong. That was what we saw. It's like if I, if I read it again, well, depending on how I read it, I might get only the last value or I might store previous values. So this was definitely you know, the most dangerous thing. So let's make it more explicit. One thing that I could do, instead of just looking at this variable, I could say, if the producer would give me a function, and now I have to say, Eric, this is not a function, this can never be, you know, this is kind of the weirdest thing. If you look at something that takes void and returns a value, there's not many interesting mathematical functions that can have that thing, right? Because a function is something where you give it the same argument, it gives the same result. So this thing is really isomorphic to just T. So if you, but like every, like there's so many functions in Haskell, or not, not in Haskell, in C Sharp or Java that take void and they do useful things, okay? So, but they're not functions, but that, that's why they're called funks. You know, they're a little bit amputated <laughs> functions. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so what, what I can do is I can say, you know, the producer can hand me, the consumer, a func, and every time I want to see a value, I will call that func, and it will give me the value. So now I've encoded that side effect in this, you know, function, this little thunk that, you know, that I share, and I can now ex make explicit the fact that I want to read that thing. Now, if you look at... Um, in C sharp, at least, how um, properties work. Properties have getters and setters, and poor Java programmers, you have to say, you know, get foo and set foo. In C sharp, you just say foo, foo equals five. But really, what happens is that you call, or when I say, you know, x equals get foo or foo, that really means that you call get foo. So you call the getter. So that's this guy. Okay, that's one way to do it. The other one, is inversion of control, where I, as a consumer, can give a function or, you know, one of those other weird things, because this is also weird, right? Something that takes a T and returns void. If you look at it from a purely mathematical point of view, that is complete nonsense, because the only thing it can do is return unit. It just throws away its argument, it always returns unit. Super, super useful function, right? But there's many functions that return void, that do great things. Console.write line, you know, should not do anything because it returns void. Um, but still, you know, my most used function. <laughs> <laughs> All right? But here, the, the trick here is that I, as a consumer, give the producer a function that it can call to notify me whenever a new value is available. Okay, so there's these two ways to kind of communicate, so either the producer gives me a function, or I, as the consumer, give the producer a function. And there you see that they go in opposite directions, and guess what? Signatures here also go in opposite directions. Woo! Something beautiful is starting there. 
Um, okay, so let's look a little bit more into this. Um, oh, there, there's an arrow missing here. Oh, that maybe the, 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 the PowerPoint ran out of arrows, or what is it? The <laughs> keynote ran out of arrows. Um, but the thing is, like, you know, and this is what, I, what I'm trying to say here. It's like, there's beautiful mathematical theory, but when you write code, you have to think about the operational details. And the same here. So I, I kind of already waved my hands, with, and I pass a function to you, and you pass a function to me, blah, 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 blah. But there's more to it, right? First of all, there must be some initial handshake where you know, the producer and the consumer um, establish the fact that you know, they want to communicate values between each other. Then maybe the consumer can say, you know what? I've seen 0, 1, 2, 3. I'm a physicist. I know that it will be 4, 5, 6, and so on. So don't even tell me any more values. So the consumer wants to tell the producer, that's enough. I'm not going to, I'm not interested in any more values. And on the other hand, the producer, just like here, might run out of values. So it has to tell the, the uh, consumer, sorry, guy or, or girl or whatever program, there will be no more values. Okay, so there, there's, there's more to it than just um, simple functions. So let's um, encode this. Um, and for the Java programmers, they will um, recognize here the iterable interface. C sharp programmers call that enumerable. Um, and and the, the closure programmers will say, oh, yeah, of course, this is closure. This is the semantic domain of closure, right? That this is sequences. Um, and so sequences, yes, they are everywhere. There's, in Haskell, the only type you use are lists. Other types you never even, you know, I, I don't know. I only write lists. The lists are even kind of, you know, they're right in the, in the syntax everywhere. But anyway, so this is the initial handshake. The consumer asks the producer, give me this thing that I can call if I want the next value. Um, now, um, in order to get the next value, I can get a value, or the, the, the producer can say, I'm done, or the something can go wrong with the producer, right? They can throw an exception. So really, that function that I showed you should be something like this. So it's, a, it's something that takes unit and returns either a value or nothing, that means termination, or an exception, throws an exception, something went wrong. Well, this is the clumsy way, you know, if you don't have union types, you have to encode that in a clumsy way. Um, I'm sorry, um, are there F-sharp programmers here? No F-sharp programmers? Okay, good. Then, uh, this is beautiful. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is such an elegant encoding of union types. Um, <laughs> and then the other thing here, is that when the consumer asks for the enumerator, the producer gives us an enumerator, but that enumerator is also disposable, which means that you, the, the uh, consumer can say, I disposed of this, I don't need any more values. So, um, so this is uh, how it works. Good. I don't have my glasses on, Dave, so this is not going to help. Um, but, uh, I'm, but, <laughs> Okay, good. So where do where should I stand for them? Here. Oh, that's. Oh, I I thought I I should watch on this. Then I have to kind of look at at Charles and look at. Oh, too many side effects on me. <laughs> All right. Good. So now let's turn this thing around. So we 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 said like you know one way was that the um, the producer could give me as the consumer this function that I could call to get the next values, but. Let's turn it around. I want to be in control. If I'm the consumer, I'm going to tell to the producer, here's a function, and you can call me back. Here's my phone number. Just call me back when you have something interesting to say. I'm not going to, get, you know, I'm in control. So that is this one. So what you do here is you subscribe, the, the producer subscribes to the consumer by giving it a function or interface. And in this case, we encode, um, again, the union type um, by having three different functions here. Um, and again, there's this way to say, um, I'm done. So when you give the uh, producer your observer, you get back a disposable, you, then you can say, I'm not interested anymore. Okay, so here you see that there's two ways to, to um, communicate sequences of values. 
In the first case, it was the producer that was in charge because the producer would kind of, you know, um, you know, have this function. And in this case, it's the consumer that's in charge because the consumer just hands over this function to the producer and it will kind of, you know, um, notify whenever uh, a value is ready. Um, but the interesting thing here, and let me see if I can, yep, look at this. Look at this thing here. So I, I had to encode that weird um, union type here, but look, it looks exactly the opposite. And that reflects the, 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 the difference in the protocol where, you know, that the protocols work in, in a different direction. All right, so this is uh, the two ways you can um, communicate sequences of values. And so the real trick is that when you look at a program, you should not say, oh, you know, mutability is bad. You should really look at what are the effects that are going on and how do you want to communicate these effects between, you know, the different parts of your program. And in this case, you have to choose, you know, whether you want that sequence of values, whether you want to kind of, you know, expose that as an enumerable, so as a pool-based sequence, or as an observable, as a push-based sequence. Now, the interesting thing, and I'm, I won't go back on all the slides, but you can ask yourself, Eric, that code that you wrote, that was like horrible. You're iterating over a, an array, putting all these values in, you know, inside the closure, inside the list, and then you're printing that out. Why didn't you just capture that array directly? Well, that, <laughs> that would be this case, right? So it was kind of weird what I was doing there. Um, but anyway, maybe I wanted to kind of do it in this other way, okay? So the, the, the thing is that side effects are good. Side effects are good, you know? I don't know if, if, if he or she agrees. But um, you have to kind of you think about how you, um, how you design the protocol. Now, I talked here about uh, multiple values. Now you can say, oh, but Eric, I'm not doing kind of mutation. I only deal with constants. There's only one value. But even then, you can have side effects. If you're a Haskell guy, you're saying, well, or, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm never computing anything until you ask for it, because maybe you never ask for it, and then I will have done something, you know, that was not necessary. I'm a lazy person. Um, so that is, you know, in some sense, a way that the consumer and the producer communicate, right? The producer is lazy. It won't do anything unless the consumer explicitly asks for it. And then you only get one value. And if you ask a second time, you, you're guaranteed to get the same value. But the thing is lazy. So that's another thing that you have to be careful about. And if, if I have a function that returns an int, well, that's different than a function that returns something that when I ask for it will return the int, right? So there's this subtle difference there. So the, again, you have to be super careful about what, what the effects are of your computation. So in this case, if there's even one, we can use the type lazy of t, and the lazy of t has one operation, namely, give me the value, which at that point will compute the value and return it, and the next time you ask for it, it will return exactly the same uh, value. That's at least, you know, the guarantee there's nothing you know, again, since we're here in the imperative language, there's nothing here that if you ask for value again, that will give you another one, right? Um, which is the beauty as well, actually. So like, ah, now you've asked five times for this value. Ah, now I'm going to give you something else. Let, let's see how good of a coder you are. Um, that's the kind of what I usually do in my code. Um, and then here's my other favorite type, task of T. Not because I'm such a task-oriented person, a more creative, kind of, you know, chaotic person, but this one has such a beautiful signature. Look at this. So what is a task? A task is something that has a continue with method. And look at that. That takes a function that takes a task and returns some value, and then returns a task. <laughs> wow. It is, this thing seems to be in the wrong place. Because why, if I have a task 
you know, why would you, you know, give this function, why would it you know, give me the task? Well, fortunately, it also has this guy here where I can, that I can use to, to grab the result. Um, by the way, this one is a co-monad, okay? So um, if, you, if, you're, if you're bored now and you, you would say, what's going on here? This type here, this is the bind of a co-monad. Um, so C Sharp actually now has support for both monads and co-monads in the language. I think that's pretty kind of, you know, pretty nice for, for a weird um, imperative language that it has that. Um, now note, and this really makes me sad, makes me more sad than killing that little animal there, <laughs> is that lazy of T and task of T are not interfaces. So the enumerable and observable were interfaces, but suddenly these things here are concrete types. Um, and that is, why is that? I mean, if you're a, a programmer, I think the reason is that languages like Java and C Sharp are too confusing with classes and interfaces and abstract base types and whatever. It's like, oh, and so there's too much choice. And then, well, it's just like the pigeonhole principle, right? If you have too much choice, at some point you will make the wrong choice. Um, so I think this is a wrong choice here. But let's look at it from the bright side. What we have seen is that we started with one type so this is the producer that had a mutable variable of type int, and let's generalize it to type t. And then we saw that really there were four more choices that were hidden behind that simple program, right? So it looked like a trivial program that just, you know, was communicating integers between producer and consumer. But really, you know, we could say, well, you know, if, if this thing produces many values, I can um, interact with it you know, in a pool-based or push-based way. Or if it produces only one, I can either do it lazy or um, in, in an asynchronous way. Okay? So there's five things here. And now I like Chinese food. And guess what? If you, you cannot make Chinese food without five spice powder. You cannot make code without five effects, okay? So these five effects are the things that make your code kind of tasty and beautiful, okay? And then the other thing, and which I really believe in, that these spices or these effects create a balance. So this is the thing, is when you write your code, you have to have this balance. You have to think about the balance, you know? Is your code only push-based or is it only pull-based? Is it blocking all the time? Or So this is all about like, you know, you are like the chef and you have to cook your program. Um, you can cook other things, maybe you, know, you can make more money using that, but I think you know, cooking code is kind of more fun. All right, so um, let's put this kind of yin yang thing up here. Um, I'm a hippie, I don't know what happened you know, here. I had like highlighted this thing here, you know, opposite forces attract this and that. Um, does this look like yin yang? Yeah. All right, but if you, if, you, if you look back at the examples I gave, there was this yin-yang, right? There was this thing, I give you a function that you can call me back with, or you give me a function that I can, so there's this, there were these opposites. So there's something deep in there that, you know, when you're coding, that you think about these kind of opposites. You know, can I do it in this way, or can I do it in a completely opposite way? And since this is Chicago, and there's many people from the financial industry, another way to say it is like every coin has two sides. And you know, it, you, know you always have to look at both sides. But the other thing is also, you have to find where's the real value. I can flip a coin, but you know, I need to make some money, right? So I need to, need to make more coins. So um, where's the value? And let's look into that. Well. I think the real value is in making a distinction. Oh, now the poor guys in Australia, I was kind of jumping around. Okay, I'm still here. Um, haven't disappeared. So the thing is that you, that you have to kind of, you know, that's another thing that I think is super essential in functional programming, is that you separate the concepts of interface from implementation. So in this case, 
when I gave you this interface for pool-based communication, that was an interface. And there's many concrete types that implement that interface, okay? But if you compose your programs, if you glue your code together, you do that in terms of the interface. And I think if anything, you know, I think functional programming has more to do with this concept than with side effects. Functional programming is all about being aware of hidden assumptions and then making them, making them explicit or ignoring them, but you know, ignoring them knowingly um, whenever they don't really matter. Okay, so let's look a little bit more into this. Um, and as I said, um, in OO programming, I think this distinction is often blurred because there's too many ways to kind of do it half. If you have an abstract base class, well, is that an interface or is that a class? Well, it's, it's kind of, you know, some zombie kind of halfway through. Okay, so, and, and I think if you look at Go or old-fashioned COM or modern COM, there the, the difference between interface and implementation was super, super crisp and clear. Um, and in functional programming, that uh, separation is also crisp and clear. If I give you a function, the only thing you can assume is its signature, okay? That's the interface. And then I can give you any implementation of that function, but there's nothing more you can do about it. The only thing you can, that you know is its interface. So I think that's one of the strong points about functional programming is that it kind of forces this strict separation between um, interface and implementation, whereas, you know, I don't even know, here's like protected virtual partial blah, it's like, uh, my head is starting to spin. I, I always have to, I admit this, every time I have to use all these, you know, quantifiers, I, ha I have to go and look in the manual, what does this mean? Oh, protected, oh, is that something different than, kind of, you know, uh, I, I, like in JavaScript, everything is public, so why do, so can anybody tell me why Java and C Sharp have this kind of crazy stuff, where it's like the language that everybody uses has only kind of public things? I don't know. So I make everything public. I don't like private. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's look at some Haskell now, okay? And again, I'm, I'm not trying to teach you Haskell. I'm trying to teach you the thinking that I think is the value behind functional programming. So let's look at this thing here, fold R. That's something that takes a list, and uh, let me kind of make sure that I stand here, something that takes a list and folds it down to a value of type B. So it takes a list of A's and it folds it down to a, a value of type B. And what it does, it says when you have the empty list, that's the first parameter there, that's B. And then when you have a, a list that's composed out of you know, an element A, and then the result of folding the list, then you just kind of apply the first operation. So this is kind of you know, a higher order function. Everybody's using this fold R. Um, you already see here that this thing takes two functions, or you know, one function and, and a B, and in that sense it's good, because it, it strictly separates the interface from the implementation. It says, if you give me B and this function, I can now reduce this list down to a value. But if you're a real Haskell programmer, you see that there's still a concrete type. There's still that list, these angle brackets. First of all, this is kind of one of the only types that use this kind of dist fix notation. So it's like, ah, eyesore. I don't want to see that. Um, but also, why couldn't I fold anything else? Why can I fold only lists? So in Haskell, you can say, well, as long as there are certain operations on here, and I will show you in the next slide what they are, I can fold something of type T of A to a B if you give me these two functions. This is quite remarkable. So, um, well, if you're, if you're using closure, there's no types at all, so this, this probably all doesn't make sense to you in the first place. If you're a JavaScript programmer, you, know, you don't use types at all. You don't know what this means either. Um, but if you're an F-sharp programmer, or a Java programmer, or a um, C-sharp programmer, or a VB programmer, we all love VB, of course, um, this is really weird. Because this is a generic function where the type parameter is a type constructor. And that is the thing that I miss most in C-sharp and F-sharp. Um, and and whatever functional languages, 
that they don't have these kind of you know, higher kind of types. I think Scala has them by now. Um, but this is super powerful because I don't want to have something that only works for lists. I want to make it work for arbitrary data structures, okay? And that's what this thing kind of allows you to do. And then you can write functions like this saying, you know, I can find something in a container of A's if you give me a predicate and then this thing must be foldable and then you can see that's probably implemented in terms of fold. So now this type gives you a lot of information because it kind of tells you exactly what are the assumptions on the types uh, that you need in order to make this implementation work but it says nothing more and nothing less. So that is, I think, the important thing of types. Why I like types is because it, it gives you this kind of specification of this problem in a very abstract way that it just tells me as a, as a developer, this is what you need to supply and then I, will, I can kind of you know, find this element for you. Now, in, in Haskell, there's these things called type classes have nothing to do with classes in, in C Sharp or Java. Um, but a type class is really, you know, just a collection of functions. Um, so here's like a monoid, something that you might, you know, if you go to a cocktail party or, you know, maybe uh, afterwards and with a beer, yeah, today I kind of defined three monoids. Uh, oh, but I defined five monads. Oh, but I did 10 co-monads. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. Um, but what is a monoid? It's just something, you know, that has a binary operator that can kind of glue two, two of them together. And then there's a neutral element, that's all. Monoids are not kind of, you know, that special. So when this Haskell people love to have these kind of things, fold, monoids, whatever, they try to impress you. Don't believe them. <laughs> all right? But here's the thing, okay? And this is a, 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 where I want to kind of you know, get at is that if you're using these type classes, um, really, if you have a signature like that, it says, you know, fault, you know, assumes that M is a monoid, and then, you know, you can take T of M to M. Really, that's a shorthand for passing three functions um, as an argument to that function. Except that the compiler will inject that um, stuff for you. So, uh, I once made a remark that, you know, dependency injection is for people that don't know math. And I still believe that because what this is really doing, this is kind of, you know, dependency injection is controlled dependency injection, but you're explicit about it. I don't want to have something in some XML file, it's like, ooh, XML. And, it's, and that kind of then you know, changes how my program behaves. Okay, so the whole point about functional programming is that you make everything explicit, you're super explicit about it, and then when you know what you're doing, okay, when you're a little bit competent, then you can let the compiler take care of it, okay? But never ever pretend that you're smarter than whoever, and it's like, oh, well, I'll just do a kind of XML file here on the side, and now that's will kind of you know, mess around with my code. No, 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 no. You have to be able to express everything in terms of this super explicit thing with, you know, look, what that means is this. And so, you know, whenever the compiler can figure out that there's only one choice for that monoid, yes, then it can inject it, but not because, you know, you, you wrote that in an XML file. Okay? Now, if you would have looked at this type and, you know, listened carefully to me, you said, Eric, but are you talking about? There's still a concrete type. I still see that arrow. You have not abstracted to the extreme and, and you're such an extreme person. And now you're kind of, look at this. One, two, three, four, five arrows in here. How can you do that? I mean, it's staring in your face. Bad. Okay. So, if you go all the way, all the way and you say even this arrow is something that's not a concrete type, that should be an interface, then you get category theory, okay? So again, category theory, a lot of people are scared about it. It's nothing. It's just mathematicians doing interface-based programming, okay? <laughs> that's it. So now you know category theory. Um, and so what they're saying is that, well, 
All I need is I need to have some function from A to B. What, do, what are the operations on a function? And they don't call it function, they call it morphism. That sounds better. <coughs> Morpheus, yeah, like the red pill. <laughs> okay, so I have to go from A to B, or there should be like some arrow here. And if I can go from B to C, there was an arrow here from A to C. So that's the composition. That arrow disappeared. I think this is when you go from PowerPoint to Keynote. Um, the arrows disappear. Um, <laughs> and then you have to go kind of, you know, um, this is what mathematicians like. They kind of like things to be kind of, you know, that if you have A, that you can go to A, and that, you know, if you compose that, that kind of falls out. Yeah, sure. So really, this is like a monoid with kind of, you know, semicolon as the kind of you know, composition operator, but forget about that, okay? But now the trick is that you should not fall in love with category theory. I see so many people, and I was one myself. Oh, category theory. You go into a black hole, you go into a rabbit hole, and you know what's down in the rabbit hole? Okay, well, the rabbit droppings, right? <laughs> You don't want to come out of the rabbit hole all kind of, you know, smudgy and so on. So don't go into the rabbit hole of category theory. <coughs> okay, show that you're proficient and just step back and say, okay, I understand what they want. These are just kind of poor mathematicians that also try to be like programmers. Okay, I see it. Good, move on with your life. Um, but of course, mathematicians are much smarter than us. Okay. And like, look, you're, if you're in the kind of financial industry, you're writing code or whatever, but you know, your mathematician friends or your kind of, you know, physic, physicist friends, those are the quants, those are now, they are kind of eating caviar somewhere, you know, across the street, okay? So we should learn from mathematicians. We should steal from their ideas. So if you look at um, category theory, they also know yin yang, only they call it duality. And they don't make kind of a big deal with like warm and hot and sharp and soft. But no, they just say you, you reverse the arrows and then you get something useful. Oh, great. So if I kind of reverse the arrows, I get something useful. So uh, that's how I kind of invented this thing, you know, these two protocols. I just looked at one and I said, okay, I'm doing the yin yang thing and I kind of reverse the arrows and there must be something useful there too. Great. But then, of course, I don't say that. Now I am teaching all my tricks to you. Um, but that's all you do, okay? So but don't go into that rabbit hole. Just look at that and say, okay, that's some idea I can steal. And, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Monads, don't even, you know, it's like, if, if you ever if you hear yourself say the word monad, go, you know, contact a shrink, okay? <laughs> Something is deeply wrong with you. Um, Okay, let's go back. This is my uh, last slide nearly. Because if you looked at what I was trying to do, I was trying to solve a practical problem. Does it really matter that these guys are dual? I don't know, it's kind of, I used that as a trick to go from one to the other, but does it really matter? I don't know. Does it matter that both are monads and co-monads, that they're self-dual? Does it matter that your brain is now in this kind of knot where you know it's kind of all tied up and you, I don't know. I, it solved my problem, I got my paycheck, so I'm happy. <laughs> okay, so the world is imperative. Never forget that, okay. Never forget that. If somebody wants to prove me wrong, I'm happy. Okay, functional programming is a great tool for thought but imperative programming is the tool for hackers. Thank you very much. I completely lost track of time, so I, I don't know. It's all right, they're not sure where they are. <laughs> all right. So we got time for a couple of questions. Someone wanted to prove. <laughs> That's great. Everybody's scared that, that, they will, that they will end up, you know, okay. Rich. Ah, what I mean by a value is, um, 
nothing special. Okay, so, and I know that, well, we will see from you that you, that you kind of, you know, for you a value is something that kind of, you know, has kind of magic powers. Um, <laughs> for me, a value is anything that I can assign to a variable in C Sharp or Java that I can smack and mutate and whatever. It's just something that I can stick in that, you know, in that position. Um, so there's nothing special with that. Um, and again, because the valueness, if, if it matters that this thing is a value in kind of, you know, in your sense, I, I don't know, I haven't seen your talk yet, but in that case, you, what I would say is you have to make that effect explicit. And so if you have an enumerable of T, but that T itself, you know, you want to consider that as a value, you might want to do it as an enumerable of lazy of T. And so you kind of push that, that you make the effects kind of explicit until the value the mutation of it doesn't matter anymore. So this is about like whether you do, you know, it's like the essence, right? You push it as far out as necessary, but not for farther. And sometimes you say, I'll just mutate it as is. So that's, um, you know, the, the quick answer here. So I, I'm, I'm a super pragmatic guy. I mean, um, I just want to get my work done and I'm happy to steal left and right, but sometimes you just have to kind of, you know, kill the baby. 